Thank you so much. Whew, well, this is what you get when you ask a guy from Michigan to uh, present at your conference. You a bunch of tech support stuff. Oh, help me. I don't know how to do something. I'm from Michigan. So here we go. Uh, speaking of me being from Michigan, I appreciate your being patient with me. My ways are different than your ways. I have different delicacies. You know, the struggles that I face are probably different than the ones that you face. My culture is a little bit different up here in the far north. We have different seasons, you know, but I appreciate your being patient with me and uh, including me in your shrug user group. Um, and I'll tell you in a few months, I'm definitely gonna wish that I was visiting there in person. So what I thought about, what am I gonna talk about to these people? And I, well, well, Seven Hills, why don't I talk about uh, how to map incredibly rugged, steep, dangerous terrain, uh, advanced cartographic methods for mapping mountains. I mean, this is the Seven Hills. Uh, and then I was like, well, we could also do something about football recruiting footprints uh, between you know Florida and Florida State, that might be kind of interesting. Oh my goodness, what do I do? What do I do? I, I, we don't have enough time to do both of these justice. I have to pick one or the other, right? Or I could just you know do them both really half-heartedly, and uh, let's just go ahead and do that one, the half-hearted option. Okay, all systems go on the half-hearted option. Let's start with football. Now. I know that there's a dominant football program in the state of Florida. And every year, you know, you get ups and downs and stuff. But I, I thought I would take a look at some of the other programs in Florida. You, you all have a rivalry game coming up here pretty soon, 10 days from now or something like that. Florida State versus Florida. Interesting. What if we take a look at these teams? Well, I can grab the roster from the website and just, you know, scrape it. Copy and copy and then just paste it right into Excel. Because when it comes to making maps, it's like 99% data munging and fixing and hunting and Googling and searching uh, and then 1% actual map making. And then of that 1%, it's 0.2% uh, visual cartographic work, if you can believe it. And you can take those stats to the bank. So here I am cleaning up this data. Uh, instead of freshman, we can do FR, that kind of thing, making it consistent. Oh, are you serious? Uh, combining the town and the state uh, in one value. And look at these state abbreviations. What is this? 1988 MISS dot? Come on. So, okay, Excel, Googling, how to separate things into different cells based on a, a comma. Oh, okay, good. I can do a convert text to columns and use comma, comma as the delimiter. Now I've got it. And now I can actually work on converting all these ridiculous abbreviations into the standard GIS friendly two letter state abbreviation for crying out loud. Now I'm gonna add country here and it's pretty obvious uh, where most of these are, the good old US of A, but every football team uh, has delivered to it in a crate a couple of Australian kickers, every one. And I wanna make this as easy as possible later on for the geocoder, because I'm gonna be geocoding these if you can believe it, because eventually we're gonna be not looking at an Excel spreadsheet. We're gonna be looking at a map, trust me. We're gonna get there in about eh, 45 to 50 minutes though, so hang tight. So I added country there. I was curious about this. Every team has a uh, Australian kicker on it. What are the major exports of Australia? It turns out they're not quite in the top five. It, they come in at number six under aluminum oxide for top ex Australian exports. College kickers. So here we are, look at this height, uh, six, four. And frankly, I was kind of surprised that Excel didn't format this as a date. You know, Fabian Lovett's height, is June 4th. You know, I was surprised that it didn't do that, but we can chop this up and actually make it into a quantitative element instead of what's technically a text string right now. So let me split these out again based on a delimiter. 
and get them in two different cells. And now I can say the foot cell is multiplied by 12 and I can just add that to the inches cell and get a nice handy, oh shoot, when I deleted my inputs, it broke the formula, thanks a lot, Excel. So I'll go back, here's my formula, uh, oh, it's broken. Okay, I have to paste as values. I'll copy the formula results, paste the inches as values. You guys probably all know what I'm talking about. Data management, goofing around in Excel, trying to get some just numbers for crying out loud. So here we are, and I can add the Florida State roster and the Florida roster into one table, and we're off to the races because what I want to make is an origin destination map, a hub and spoke diagram. Where are these players from and where are they converging into? So origin, destination, that's what we're gonna make. Buckle up. So here we are in Wikipedia because I need to figure out the coordinates of my destination. So uh, to Doak Campbell Stadium in Tallahassee, what are the coordinates for that thing? Well, I can look it up on Wikipedia. Oh, goodness sakes. Degrees, minutes, seconds? Really? Wikipedia? What am I going to do with degrees, minutes, seconds? I thought I was done with, with formulas. But guess what? If I just click this, it takes me to this site. Oh, thank goodness. It gives me a decimal degree version of this. 30.438056 latitude. Oh, I mean, I love a base 10 system. You can actually do math with it. Base 10 rules. It's great. But so much of what we do in geography and geometry and time tracking is inherited from ancient Sumerians' base 60 system. What the heck? Why? Why is the full sweep of a circle 360 degrees? It's because ancient Sumerians had 360 uh, days in a year, and it was their notion of completeness, full circle. We've gone full circle, 360. And then you divide that up into 60s, and 60 kind of has some nice things because you can like count the knuckles on your fingers, I'm told. Whatever. Give me base 10 any day of the week. We're stuck with it because of the Sumerians. Base 60 system. I mean, these guys loved base 60. This guy, uh, he doesn't care about base 60. So here we are back in our nice base 10 decimal degree format, latitude, longitude, destination for both of these teams. This is the stadium coordinates for Florida State and for Florida, the Gators. So here we are in, believe it or not, ArcGIS Pro. Yes, we made it. But guess what? We're still looking at a table. No maps yet. Sucker. Okay, so we've got our destination lat and long. And I'm going to geocode these. I'm going to geocode these. And uh, I've conveniently got the city, the state, and the country all lumped in there. Oh my goodness, this tool consumes credits. That always makes me a little bit nervous. Can I afford this? How much does a credit car cost? Uh, one, uh, 40 credits for 1,000 addresses geocoded. Oh my gosh, I feel like uh, I'm, I've got like tickets at Chuck E. Cheese and I'm trying to figure out how many erasers I can afford for my kids. Okay, 40 credits per 1,000. That's 9.7 credits for my 242 addresses that I'm going to geocode. Uh, what does that cost in troop bucks? I don't know. So let's look it up. Okay, 100 bucks for 1,000 credits. Okay, interesting. If you want to buy 1,000 credits, it costs 100 bucks. Uh, well, 1,000 credits for $100, that's 10 cents per credit. Okay, uh, that means that my 240 uh, addresses cost less than 10 cents to geocode. Well worth it. I could have afforded literally double that many geocodes. Thank you very much. So here we are back in ArcGIS Pro. We've successfully geocoded. Geocoding is magic, by the way. What a magical thing to take coordinates or an address and ask a robot uh, the latitude, longitude position where that lives. I love it, it's beautiful. So there we are, we finally got some points. Look at all those recruits coming to Tallahassee and Gainesville from all over the country and a couple of Australians. Um, now it's time to uh, calculate the geometry because I've got my destination locations, those are the points, but I want the origin locations or the origin locations. Uh, I'm gonna ask it, hey, give me an attribute for the X and the Y of these origins, these towns. I've got my destination there from before. And here we go. So I've got destination lat and long and origin lat and long. We have four ordinates per player, folks, which means we can run something amazing, a hub and spoke, draw a line tool. But first, 
we're not monsters. I'm not going to leave this in WGS 84 all day. We need to get this into an equidistant projection because we're geographers and we know that if we're working with distances, straight line paths and that kind of thing, we'd better get uh, 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 equidistant pro projected coordinate system underneath us, get our footings, right? Uh, and plus it looks a little bit better, honestly. So here we are in the United States with an equidistant conic projection. Uh, and now we're going to run our X, Y to line. I've got the X's and Y's. It's time to connect these dots and draw some origin, destination, hub and spoke lines. Ciao. There they are converging into the glorious state of Florida from all over the country. But frankly, a lot of them are really from Atlanta. Atlanta. Man, they love recruiting in Atlanta. So let's take a closer look. I'm going to get rid of all that color in my base map. It's so distracting. I want to focus on these players, these high school kids getting recruited from all over the country coming to Florida. Where are they from? Get rid of all that gr green and blue. Plus, those are the colors of the Florida Gators, and we don't want to kind of mix and match and confuse folks. So I'm going to use a luminosity blend mode on my imagery, and whoop, all of a sudden I've got a grayscale base map, which is quite cool. And now I'm going to add via Living Atlas, a little tab there called Living Atlas. I'm going to search for human geography. I've got a human geography detail and label overlay. These are vector base map overlays. You know, they just happily nest right on top of my imagery. Just give me a sense of what's where. Give me some state borders, some state names. Okay, let's take a look at these lines. Do we want to keep uh, solid fleshy lines all over our map? No. We can do better than the defaults always. So I'm going to choose unique values, color code them by team. There are two teams. We get some saltwater taffy themed lines by default, but we can tweak those to uh, gator blue and a little like push this way back to like 80% transparency. You can see them start to converge, but it's not shouting at you the whole time. And we'll do the same thing for Florida State. We'll get that beautiful golden color and we'll push that back to 80% transparent as well. Now we've got some really charming little um, hub and spoke lines for kids coming to school to play some football. Look at these points though. Uh, are these good enough? No. We can do better. We're gonna color code them, of course, but what if we did something with all that data that we cleaned up in Microsoft Excel? Remember all that work we did? Pasting values and stuff to get the number of inches tall that Fabian Lovett is? So. Let's uh, let's get some uh, symbology going. Look at this tab in the symbology panel. Very symbology by attributes. A little green square tab. There's a very unassuming checkbox down there called allow symbol property connections. Clearly, everybody knows what this means, right? Eh, I don't know. If you check this box, all of a sudden, Every little attribute in your symbology panel is going to have a little database icon next to it, and you can link that up directly with data. And it is empowering. It's amazing. So here we are in our unique values. I'm going to start with Florida State, obviously. And instead of a circle, I'm going to expand that little set of line options, and I'm going to choose a line. Instead of a circle shape, I'll do a line shape. Give me a line. And I'll uncheck. Uh, Let's see what I'm going to do. Oh, I'm going to set some attribute mapping. See those little database icons? I'm going to click that database icon for the size of the line. And I'm just going to peg that right to the player's height. And we're done. Ship it. Now we can do a little bit better than this. It's uh, huge. So what I've done now is unchecked scale proportionally so that instead of everything kind of growing in scale, it's only growing in height. Height, right? We've got some natural mapping happening here. Height of the player corresponds to the height of these line symbol icons. That's cool. I like this. Um, but they all kind of look the same. They're a little bit tall. So let's open up this height. Maybe we can kind of play with this as a formula. So I'll open this up. I'll subtract 65 inches right off the bat uh, here just because, I mean, the, the shortest player is still taller than 65 inches. So I'm going to subtract 65 inches from it, and then I'll do like a little multi, I'll double it just so I get some variability in the shorter to taller players. Now I've got short and tall lines representing player height. <clears throat> and I'm going to set the anchor point to be half of the Y dimension so that its little foot grows out from, you know, you see all the players, hometown in Tallahassee, you know, the bottom of the thing is in Tallahassee, and it grows up from there. So it grows up instead of just kind of 
you know, you know what I'm saying. Now let's do the same thing for width and we'll use the weight attribute and we're done, ship it. Just kidding. So here's weight. Of course, we're gonna open up this formula and immediately we're gonna subtract 125 pounds right off the bat from everybody. And it looks a lot better. And we're gonna multiply it by 0 0.02 just to kind of get some nice variability. And there we are. We have some width and height uh, symbols which are data driven based on the little player icons, the data that we got. Isn't that fun? We just copied this from the internet and we're goofing around with it in Pro. But I think those columns are kind of boring. Let's make them kind of cool gradient rounded little cylinders or something like that. So here I am in that little wrench structure tab. <clears throat> I'm gonna duplicate this thing. And instead of a solid gold fill, I'm gonna open up this shape line symbol and I'm gonna format this symbol to be a gradient stroke instead of a solid stroke. And that gradient strokes color scheme is gonna go from not this, but this, a little bit of shadow, a little bit of highlight, transparent in between. And the result kind of makes it look like we've got a little uh, shaded 3D cylinder extruding up from our location of origin. And we're not done because if you've got a, a cylinder shooting up from the ground, it's going to cast a little bit of a shadow. So let's give it a little bit of a shadow. We'll add a marker layer. We'll drag it down to the bottom and instead of solid black dot. We're gonna make this a gradient also. <clears throat> we'll choose a circular continuous smooth gradient that goes from black to transparent black. And now we've got everybody with little bitty shadows, which is cute and that's important. We'll do the same thing for the gators too, because we have to. Okay, so we've got Florida State, we've got Florida uh, players all over the map. Let's see what we can do in a layout. So I've made a layout and here we are, ship it. Now, okay, we can come up with a better orientation than this. So I'll activate this, I'll zoom in to uh, you know, a perspective that I like, this is nice. I'm, I'm looking at the you know, 48 states here. Uh, why, just because we got a couple kids recruited from Seattle and LA, we have to you know, crunch everybody down now? Let's go to the area of interest, mainly Florida. The man, metropolitan Atlanta, holy smokes, that's a hotbed for recruiting well-worn roads for the assistant coaches driving up to Atlanta. Uh, so I've zoomed in and the orientation could be a little bit better. So I'm gonna uh, take this and see what we've got. And uh, I'm gonna open up the properties for this. And I'm just gonna rotate it. See the rotation is zero by default, but it kind of fits better this way. 30 degree rotation, in my map view, I like it. And because we've got a vector base map, all those labels are happy just to stay flat for me, which rules. And frankly, I was a little bit surprised that my little extruded cylinders um, knew to still go straight up. I love that. Thank you, Pro. Thank you for thinking of that before I did. And I'm gonna copy this map. Why have one map when you can have like four versions of that map? I'm gonna copy this thing and paste it into the same layout. This is the same map appearing twice in one layout. That's cool. I'm gonna set the rotation so it looks a little bit better here. I'm gonna do it a couple more times. And in these uh, little mini maps, I can zoom in on the home stadium of each one where all these lines converge, all these kids um, you know, emailing their mom and dad, I'm homesick. I love you guys, I, miss, I never appreciated you like I should have. What a, what a life we have. Okay, uh, look at all these service credits. Seriously, look at look at my three overview maps and my main map. It's the same thing every time. Tons of text, white text with a black outline, black text with a white outline. Oh, we can do better. Did you know that if you hit the insert tab and that dynamic text drop list, if you scroll almost all the way to the bottom, hidden almost, interesting, hard to find, there's a button called service layer credits, which if you click it, you can drop your own single version of this on the map and format it however you like, position it wherever you want, give it a reasonable size and a nice color instead of being stuck with four versions of it in big double stroked text. You can format it however you like. It's amazing, changed my life. So here we are. Let me add some bars there. We're gonna add a little bit of title. We can insert rectangles and color code them, add some text. And 
then uh, I'm going to just manually draw a legend because how am I going to do a legend for this automatically? It's easier just to draw some rectangles and layer it. No problem. That's okay, right? It's okay. That's what I tell myself. And I'm going to drag a little rectangle here in my layout and give it a gradient fill so it looks like it's a little shadow thing cast over my main map. And we have a map showing the recruiting footprints of these two storied programs converging. And they're going to meet in a few uh, few days. Next week? 10 days? I don't know. Good luck, both teams. Good luck, whichever team you're rooting for. So that's one half-hearted map demo in the can. Or is it? <clears throat> you may have noticed something in my previous map. So I shared this on Instagram because I'm a big blabbermouth when it comes to map, and I can't keep anything to myself. And some kind person said, hey, psst. P.S. You spelled Gainesville wrong. Now, I'm not surprised because literally every one of the maps that I make has at least one typo spelling error in it. Thank you so much, Rainer, for pointing this out to me. Um, the Gators would have definitely come after me. And here's the mistake. Oh, my goodness, Nelson, you fool. You even had it mapped on the map as a ref. There's no excuse for me. Fixed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a very complicated spell check system. It's me publishing a map publicly and then um, the community telling me all of my spelling issues. It's a very complicated spell check system, but it's what I use. Thank you very much, Rainer. Let's move on to the mountain mapping. You all are from the Seven Hills region. <sighs> yes, seven of them. I come from Michigan the glacially scraped tundras of the Midwest. This is as hilly as it gets. How many hills do I have in Michigan? This is how many hills that I have in my region. I'm in the zero hills regional user group. I'm, I'm, I, I would be a zrug, um, but look at you all, seven hills, Tallahassee, the land of many mountains, steep terrain, precipitous slopes. You have seven. That's a mathematically impossible proportion more than I have. Seven hills, Tallahassee, the mountains of Tallahassee. So let's let's talk about mapping the mountains of Tallahassee. So here we are in the beautiful Seven Hills region. We've got uh, imagery base map. As I as I awkwardly pause and look at the time. 9.30, doing all right. Okay, so here's the, the beautiful imagery base map for the Seven Hills area. What a great place. Look at that cool like lobe of um, center pivot irrigation agriculture there north of, north of y'all. Okay, let me pull in a digital elevation model of your area, stolen from NASA. SRTM, digital elevation model. The darker the color, the lower the elevation. The lighter the color, the higher the elevation. Yeah, frankly, I'm a little surprised at you all. I thought you'd have seven hills. Um, it was kind of flat. Not a whole lot of elevation happening here. I feel lied to a little bit. I'll forgive you. But uh, what can we do in a GIS if we're mapping an area that's surprisingly flat but you want to still show the terrain in the area. It's still a good idea to show you where there are some ups and downs and meanders in the elevation. Well, let me open up the symbology panel for this. And instead of the min max standard stretch, I'm going to mathematically chunk out these colors by elevation and choose standard deviation. This is a lot better. The fewer standard deviations we use, the chunkier and more extreme it looks. The more standard deviations, like standard deviation of three or four standard deviations, it starts getting smoother. You can standard deviation to taste, depending on how rugged you want your elevation to appear. Now, I'm going to apply the overlay blend mode, easily my favorite blend mode. Blend modes are a way of mathematically stitching the values of one pixel layer to the values of the other pixel layers. and Overlay says, hey, bright areas, you're just going to make the underlying imagery brighter and higher contrast. And load black areas, you're going to make the underlying 
uh, colors darker. And frankly, instead of telling you, why don't I just show you? It looks like this. It looks awesome. Overlay is an instant improvement. It's a, it's a, they might as well have called it the awesomeification button. Oh, you want it better? Okay, push the awesomeification button, otherwise known as overlay. Uh, for your blend mode and you get something that looks like this. Oh, interesting. I can see the lows and the highs. It's River Valley. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I don't know if I can see seven hills, but uh, they're in there somewhere. Let's take a closer look. I'll zoom in. Now we've lost a little bit of the extreme areas of the low areas down in the, the Gulf. Um, how do we uh, apply this beautiful grayscale color ramp to only the elevation areas that we're seeing because we've chopped off a lot of the lower areas. Well, I'm gonna open the symbology panel and instead of applying the color range across the whole data set, much of which is off screen now, I'm gonna choose dynamic range. Dynamic range will only look at the lowest and highest values in my view and paint the black to white color scheme according to that. And immediately we get some way better results. So dynamic range, if you're, feeling crazy and you live in a place that um, you tell people is really hilly, but it actually isn't quite as hilly as you're lighting on. You can use dynamic range to force some variability in your elevation. Wink. So what's next? Let's take a look at this color scheme. Uh, it's black to white, but <clears throat> maybe I want to make those lower areas kind of like a, a deeper emeraldy kind of green. I'll just make it just a little bit green instead of black. And you get this kind of neat, actual accidentally elevation looking color ramp. And I'll hit apply. Oh, really brighten things up. And that's prettier and I like it. And if you, it's prettier and you like it, then it's uh, scientifically valid and it's what you meant to do. So stumbling on things accidentally is frankly, all we do in cartography. And then you grab the things that you like and you move forward. Speaking of moving forward, let's fire up some raster functions and draw a hill shade. Oh my goodness. So if overlay is my favorite blend mode. Hill shade is my favorite raster function. Raster function takes a look at a digital input like an elevation model and just renders it how you ask it without making a new layer or a, or a new file. You don't have to save a new file. You can just experiment and it's not just filling up your hard drive with unnecessary pixels. I'll choose hill shade and I'll point it at my original digital elevation model. And it looks, oh geez, it looks like this. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, four, five, okay. six hills, uh, maybe there's seven hills. Uh, how do we force more ele more hill shade here? So what is a hill shade anyway? Hill shade has an imaginary light source in an orientation that you determine. In this case, there's an imaginary wall of light in the top left corner of the map. And the robot says, well, based on the elevation, I can imagine that you have light hitting these sides of things and shade hitting this side of things. And it looks like this. But if we open up um, our grayscale color scheme here, instead of just a simple you know, low to high, we can do, again, standard deviation. Standard deviation will force visual variability where there is actually quite little real life variability. It's just like in thematic mapping if we're mapping counties, population. You can use standard deviation to force variability so you can actually see where things are shadowy and where they would be hit by light, which is kind of interesting. Um, a lot of uh, high texture happening here. That's kind of interesting, uh, kind of foresty almost. Um, let me open up this function chain. So we aren't stuck with it as is. I don't have to delete this and run something else. I can just open up the function chain and see the little formulas that went into the creation of this hillshade. And I can say, you know what? I'm gonna add a little blur function to the end of this. So I'll open up the statistics, drag in a blur function, connect it, say, just do a little moving window of three by three blur. And let's see what we get. Oh, it's a little bit more pleasant. It doesn't feel quite as sandpaper as before. This is more like a, a 300 grit sandpaper instead of a 60 grit sandpaper. Uh, and, and it looks a little bit more pleasing. So. We go with it. And once again, I'm gonna fire up my favorite blend mode, which is overlay. And whoo, hello, we have got something that's positively topographic happening here in the Seven Hills area. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Thank you, blend modes. Thank you, uh, standard deviation stretching. Let's fire up slope. I mean, if hillshade is cool, maybe I can find some sloped areas in this area. I'm gonna 
open up the raster functions again, hit slope, and say, hey, apply the slope to the digital elevation model. It looks like this, of course, but you know, we can open up the symbology panel and just reverse that. So sloped areas are darker. And we can open up the color scheme and just really wail away on the black end of this. So we um, kind of force areas of slope to appear like, eh, man, uh, you're flat and you're white. But if it's sloped at all, it's going to be black or shades of gray. OK, and then we can open a blend mode. And this time I'm going to choose multiply instead of overlay, if you can believe it. He's not doing overlay. What's going on? He's crazy. Multiply only applies the darkness of a layer and it'll ignore white altogether and it'll apply darkness via your grayscale, cooking darkness based on this into your underlying stuff, which looks like this. And now my heavily sloped bank areas have some shade and I'm getting some nuances in these tributary erosional rivulets. Uh, I can see some terrain happening in the Seven Hills region. And I'm liking this. So let's open Hill Shade. Now I'm going to show you something that is, frankly, an abomination. This is a hack. I'm going to apply a Hill Shade to the slope. What does that even mean? Why would I apply a Hill Shade to a slope? I did this accidentally. Well, I didn't do it accidentally. I did it by uh, throwing Hail Marys and saying, what if I did a Hill Shade on a Hill Shade? What if I did a slope on a Hill Shade? What if I did a Hill Shade on a slope? To see what I got. And some of the results were pretty intriguing. And I thought, oh, I could use this. And I stuck it in my pocket. If I do a hill shade on a slope, which was not the intended use of this tool, by the way, but that's why I like it, and apply it to the slope, we get this. Whoa, this is kind of interesting. Do you know what we're seeing? We're seeing a vertical edge detection. So I've accidentally created a vertical edge detection. Vertical edge detection. Anywhere where the terrain kind of abruptly changes from steep to flat, it's going to, boom, call out a bright, it'll look like you've dug a big berm along that area. So it's like this. This is an elevation model. Hillshade on a slope focuses your eye on all these places where the terrain and goes, hey, look at me. I'm an edge. And so now I'm going to go back to my favorite, which is overlay, and cook this into my base map. And I get these bright little river edges on the sunlit edge of the rivers, I've got these kind of chiseled away darker areas on the shaded side. And we are just making this thing look like it's chiseled out of granite. Is there any granite? It's like we're chiseling all the coral in Florida to make it look all rugged and bumpy. OK, so I'm going to make a copy of this digital elevation model that original elevation model, the grayscale one, which I changed to kind of green scale. I'm going to hold the control key and drag it up to the top, which is the same as hitting copy and paste. I'm going to drag it to the top and let go. There it is doing its work doubly so now at the top. I don't want it to have that overlay blend mode, so I'll just make it normal. And instead of that kind of green to white color scheme, I'm going to make it semi-transparent white, faded out to like a light, light, minty, green halfway up what in the deuce just happened this is all this is there's no blend mode happening here this is just the elevation model where i said hey lower areas you get more opaque white pixels higher elevation areas you taper away to nothing then the effect is this weird trippy misty landscape where low-lying areas are cloaked in an atmospheric inversion winding their way up these river valleys low-lying swamp areas to the southeast. Isn't that fun? It's so easy. Such a hack. You just saw two hacks in a row. Now, let's add a little bit of context. I'm going to choose Living Atlas, Add Data, Living Atlas. Living Atlas, by the way, that's the team I work on. It's like uh, Wikipedia for data and maps. You can add content to it and submit it, and then an actual human being will look at it and say, yeah, actually, this is pretty cool. Uh, approved, and then it'll be available to everybody and as we can host it and whatever. So if you've got cool data that you want to share, think of um, contributing it to the Living Atlas or use Living Atlas content in your map, which is what I do. Just be a taker. Take Living Atlas content. Seize it. Use it. I've added um, some context here. So I've added roads and boundaries and some labels and our completed terrain map of the rugged, treacherous, mountainous area of the Seven Hills 
regional GIS user group. This is how to force terrain where you have not quite as much terrain as you might have, uh, appear on a map. Sometimes it's helpful to show where terrain is, even in relatively flat places. You know, Switzerland doesn't get to hog all the fun. Come on, screw that. Nice try, Switzerland. You don't have a monopoly on the terrain mapping game. We can do terrain mapping in the Seven Hills region. Um, now, if I flew by these, which I did, everything I've shown you is available here and there in probably two short, uh, kitschy little videos available on my YouTube channel, John Nelson Maps, youtube.com, John Nelson Map. Um, I like to make one minute map hacks, you know. Everything I do, frankly, is a little hack, and you can use those one-minute things as a recipe to stack up your map and do what you will. Uh, so how about it? Now, um, I'm going to ask Ned a question. Ned, I've got a little, um, maybe like another five-minute thing. Do you want me to stop here, or do you want me to continue with the five-minute thing? Please continue with the five-minute thing. Thank you, Ned. You are we got probably... Lots of, we got... Huh? We got lots of time. All right, and you're probably not going to regret this. Good. Okay. Mars, 1964. So in 1964, this was as good as it got for visualizing the surface of our friendly neighborhood planet Mars. This is all we had. This is the best uh, that we had. This is all we had. And <clears throat> that's not good enough for us. And so NASA constructed a satellite. They built a robot and strapped a 1964 TV camera onto it and built a little TV camera signal to digital data converter on this. If you can, this 1964, they did it, a digital image conversion uh, and a little tiny little uh, radar or radio antenna <clears throat> to beam content back to Earth. So they took this, they took this little robot, they strapped it to the tip of an intercontinental ballistic missile, and they blasted it into space using like trigonometry and stuff. They were able to shoot a bullet at a bullet and an impossibly small target whizzing through space from a rotating home planet of ours, also revolving and rotating around the Earth. I don't know how people do this kind of stuff. Um, I had to drop out of pre-calculus. Um, so my hat's off to all of you all who can who can do this sort of thing. It boggles my mind that we were able to do this. Anyways, it's a flyby mission. We shoot this bullet right past Mars to get a close, the first close-up picture of Mars in a flyby. And this is 1965 by the time it gets to Mars. It took almost a year to get there. And oh my goodness, the data is coming in. This is the day, the data is coming in, but we're working with an impossibly narrow little radio band, a very weak signal coming back to earth. And it would take eight to 10 hours for all of that data to be transmitted for a very basic rudimentary black and white image of Mars um, to get to the, to the folks at NASA. Eight to 10 hours, uh, I'll tell you, Reporters aren't going to wait eight to 10 hours if they see the data is coming in. I want to see some data. I want to see it. The engineers wanted to see it too. And so what they did was, and you know what? Once you got the data in 1965, how long is it going to take for your, you know, IBM building sized computer to process that into an image? Who knows? And so as the data was coming in on these little thin ticker tape, you know, stock market uh, ticking tapes, blue, blue, strips of paper, the data is coming in. It's very narrow band of low to high, just like a digital elevation model. Coming in, the engineers taped it onto a wall, the strips, and they got some crayons. They busted out some crayons and started color coding uh, each of these coloring on top of each one of these numbers because they didn't want to wait eight to 10 hours and then who knows how long. They wanted to see what the first flyby of Mars was going to show them. And so they started stripping these little numbers together and coloring it in with crayons, which is amazing. And here it is. Here's the first portrait of Mars via crayons on strips of paper assembled together. Because 
people are just amazing creatures and we're creative folks and we don't want to wait eight to ten hours uh, let's take a closer look at this so here's the full view of this crayola version um by the way the aspect ratio is actually square so it looks uh, like this and the notion of up and down means nothing in space so this is what we're actually used to seeing a planet's horizon there's mars look at that first indication of atmosphere from this flyby you can see like a little atmosphere dust storm kicked up there in the northeast this is mars this is the sur surface of mars uh now the color palette was mars like but really the data coming back is all black and white grayscale one one uh light layer we don't have three colors in this it's just grayscale it looks like this by the way once they get it all processed, this is what the actual data looked like. This was the colored in version. This is the real one. And I'm showing you this because the first interplanetary remote sensing visualization system was a pack of crayons and some gumption. So anytime you feel like, oh man, the software is a little bit too complex. I don't know. I have to learn all of this and that. Just start where Ever you are with whatever you have and start putting some pictures together and you might surprise yourself first interplanetary remote sensing system box of crayons and some gumption that's all I have to say about that all right Whew, thank you very much you know what I have to say that was a really weird presentation experience because what I was seeing on my end was a completely 90 degree rotated view of every slide and I had no idea which slide was coming next so it was like this I hit it hit next so they were as new to you as they were for me so thanks thanks for hearing me out everybody thanks shrug folks John we were happy to have you so uh, now comes the Q&A portion um, if you want to type questions in, I'll I'll give them over to John and he can answer. We have one question so far, and that is, can you send the elevation map to a 3D printer? That's from Larry King, Larry Kong. I oh man, you know I get that question so many times, and I chat with the team, different people on different teams, 3D. Like man, we would it would be so cool to have an output format that meshed with a 3D printer um, for years, but um. I think there's a little bit of traction now about supporting an expert uh, 3D export format that 3D printers like. No promises. I mean, I wish I could promise, but I've been I've been rattling cages and bugging people, and other people have too. So, I apparently they might be thinking about considering, wondering about the potential of perhaps working on it. Uh, the next question you've done what your most request uh, what is your most re uh, requested map technique that's from anthony puzo anthony i thought um um one of the stipulations of my presenting was that anthony was barred from attending i tried to stop him but he found his way in somehow i don't know uh anthony good question uh, i don't know i, I maybe uh, terrain things lately it's been kind of there's been interest in showing um how to map relatively flat areas to show their uh to accentuate the terrain that's actually there so terrain mapping for flat places has been kind of popular lately kind of like what you did today yeah yeah there are a little handful of tricks that you can do to actually show where little banks are and in river areas, you know, in, in places that you think, oh, it's too flat for me to do this kind of technique. You can you can squeeze some terrain into it. Thanks, Anthony. I love you, Anthony. Thank you. I can't stay mad at you. Um, we had someone who missed the first part of the presentation. I, I want to let everybody know this, buddy know this is recorded and will be on our YouTube channel shortly after the conference. What? Okay. Yeah, I didn't tell you. Sorry. Do we have some more questions for John? Come on, folks. I would add that there are several comments in here 
that mentioned fantastic presentation. Thank you. I love this. Oh, cool. I don't see any, I can't see any chat, but I trust you. I don't want to take my... It's under questions. Oh. Mm -hmm. I see. They, I they want to know if you located all seven hills. No, I never found all seven. I think that uh, requires an in-person reconnaissance trip. So, hey, if we're in person next year, you're invited. The second our world, the second uh, the Hulk, you know, puts on that uh, gauntlet again and snaps, and everything is back to normal. Uh, they want to know seven hills. They want to know why you chose Knowles versus Gators, and some people complaining that uh, UCF <laughs> recruiting should have been in there also. Oh, you know what's funny? I had a, a UCF, so my my picture was UCF football program instead of Florida A&M, but uh, I heard that there was a lot of Florida A&M folks, so I switched it out 10 seconds before I started. <laughs> Let's see. Um... Do you use the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite apps when creating unique maps? I've used it a couple times. What I like to use it for is when I work in Pro, there's an Adobe Creative Cloud export format called AIX. And when I use that, it makes uh, an Illustrator-friendly version where all the vector stuff is vector, the image layers are image, and it keeps all of my layer hierarchy and stuff. In the past, I used to have to export as a PDF or SVG and then op or EPS and then open it in Illustrator and then just, oh man, what a nightmare of figuring out all the clipping paths and layers and stuff, cleaning it up. But it removes all that cleanup work. So I export as an AIX, which is part of the Maps for Adobe extension in Illustrator. Um, we have some folks that want to join the Zero Hills Regional User Group when you get a chance for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, how, population one. They want to know how many hours per week do you spend experimenting on the different functions? Um, well, my job breaks down to like half and half. So half the time I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, which is build user experiences <clears throat> for the Living Atlas team and like write story maps and, and make maps using Living Atlas content. And then like half of it is writing blogs about that process and making videos showing people how to play with that data and just generally goofing around with map making and sharing the sneaky tricks that I accidentally stumbled on along the way. Like half and half. That was Stuart Court. Uh, Tony Cross wants to know, where do you get your inspiration for all of your map tutorials? Um, well, the map tutorials themselves, I like to watch a lot of YouTube maker videos. And so lately, um, so before that, it was just blog writing. And then it's kind of migrated into YouTube tutorials. But then I'll do a blog showing the YouTube tutorials. So it's kind of like both. But um, the maker community on YouTube is awesome. I mean, I like uh, Alex Steele and his um, Metalworks and Pask makes he's a woodworker from australia people do some really amazing stuff for free and they share their process and it's so generous of them and i learned a lot from how they show things and how they pace themselves and that kind of stuff and i haven't applied any of it but i'm getting better so nani castro uh, asked the question making a layout in arcgis pro is a little confusing to me still i have a lot of templates in arcgis desktop can i use them those in pro um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I, I can't answer that. Well, hi, Noni, by the way, Castro. Um, there are some Esri folks here who can probably maybe jump in on the comments thread. Um, Anthony's available to you to answer questions. Um, I don't know if you can import a layout from ArcMap. Maybe you can, but I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I will say for me personally, once you get started and learn layouts in ArcGIS Pro, you'll never want to go back just because of all the functionality you have. Layouts in Pro are fantastic. I love them. Um, Aubrey Kinghorn heads up the layout team at Esri, and man, she's just always, she's so energetic and wanting to make everything better. 
and has cool ideas and um it, it is it, it's great you know i've worked with layouts in both but um of course predominantly in pro in the last few years but yeah you can do so much and the fact that you can pull in multiple map into one layout and it's great have have multiple layouts in one project copy and yeah, paste multiple maps multiple layouts multiple everything um naughty comment followed up comment with um what do you think the spatial tools in R? I'm sorry, that's Andy Weber. Maybe there's a, uh, an explain it like um, a tutorial for layouts. That's a good idea. Maybe um, like a third of the demos that I do, the more long form demos. So if you look on the YouTube channel and it's like, <clears throat> you know, five or eight minutes or more, um, there's a very good chance I'll be working in layouts and I'll create a layout from scratch and I'll fill it with things so that might be helpful for you. I haven't done many very short form one minute hacks on uh, layouts specifically, but I should. Um, Julia Wood wants to know, how did you get uh, started or interested in cartography and GIS? Um, I, I I didn't know what I wanted to do be when I grew up. I had a eye injury and I thought maybe I wanted to be an eye doctor, but then I took a chemistry class in high school and that kind of put the nail in the coffin for those hopes and dreams. And uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was in college and I, my, my parents are both geographers. My dad was a geography professor. And so like, oh, I'll just sign up for some of the classes in that department. And I, I sat in my first lab for computerized cartography. And we did a dot density map and it started filling in. I was like, this is awesome. And I, I was into art too. So I was taking art classes and then cartography classes. And I was like, this is great. They're talking about the same things, but like a uh, person in a white lab coat over here and then a hippie is talking about the same thing over here in just very different ways. But it all made sense when it came together and I loved it. Um, Zach Wetzel wants to know, uh, do you utilize any custom Arc Pro add-in tools or custom or tools from the community sample add-ins. No, but because I'm lazy and I'm not smart enough yet to like go dig around and and add those in. Although I have added one set of tools, which is Ken Fields Terrain Tools, because I wanted to try uh, one called um, uh, False 3D Mapping. I, I forget the forget the term but anyways just that one just Ken's terrain tools but I should I should do that I'm a terrible person I should do that <laughs> um some housekeeping uh one of our um committee members wants to know if uh when we upload this to YouTube would you like us to tag your channel in the description uh, sure thanks okay will do um Andy Weber um our software compared to Arc Pro. Have you considered that or? Sorry, what? what? Our software. Oh, R. Yes. Um, uh, Pro has a um, a plugin for R. By the way, if you work in R and you do a lot of statistical work in R and you want to, at some point, get it into Pro for whatever your evil plans are. Um, yeah, you can you can integrate ArcGIS and R, um, or you can just work fully in R. I, I had I had a class where it used R, and it nearly killed me. I almost died in that class from stress. But uh, um, yeah, you can you can integrate R and Pro. That wasn't the question though. I realize I'm answering. I'm like a politician answering the question I wished I had heard. That's okay. Um. We have uh, Jacob Koble asking if you will do any uh, videos um, for your channel using demos of Photoshop and Illustrator tricks, or if you have any in your. <clears throat> um, Illustrator, I I never use Photoshop. Um, I do use Illustrator really infrequently. I use Illustrator to make SVG graphics for custom north arrows or custom icons. You can use SVG for that. Um, I will sometimes um, use Illustrator if I want to deliver a map to a customer who doesn't have a GIS. So I'm working with somebody right now and I have to 
deliver them Illustrator files with all the layers. That's what I'll use Illustrator for predominantly, but I don't do a lot of Illustrator. Sometimes I'll use Illustrator to make a texture like like the felt texture for the felt style, you know, I, so, um, but maybe, yeah, maybe I should do a, how to make a north arrow or a point symbol SVG graphic in Illustrator for Pro. That'd be kind of cool. Thank you, good idea. I'll do that. Thank you. Um, let's see, Lakeisha Coleman, what's your favorite, hold on, they're coming in so fast, it's hard to keep up. I wish what's I could your favorite see questions. I can't see them, but okay, you go ahead. Thanks What's your favorite thinking. podcast or radio show you listen to? Um, one of my early favorite podcasts was Radio Lab. Radio Lab, WNYC. Yeah. Um, great show, science. But you know, I I listen to it while I mow the lawn, and then I have to like stop for a second, kind of stare off into the void, and maybe like you know wipe a tear out of my eye, because they always like hit it home to like some personal story it's just beautifully done radio lab is great not so great anymore it's kind of hit and miss these days i think a lot of people left but anyways um 99 invisible is a great podcast talks about the built environment everything around us pretty much has been thought of and designed and built you know the sidewalks door handles so it handles um those kinds of topics that's a cool podcast um let's see what kind of videos or projects are you working on for the future what's the, what's coming i don't know i'm not uh, i'm not put together enough to actually have like a plan and a roadmap of things that i want to work on i've got a really sloppy white let me look at okay so i lied i do have a whiteboard so my next ones i want to work on are um, my three favorite blend mode recipes in the very different outcomes of those. Um, and I'm gonna do a video on how to get an XY table into a map. So par partially this demo I did today. Um, I'm gonna do a few more on like, do you, like I wrote a blog post, do you really need a, a north arrow on that map? And people were pretty interested in that. So maybe I'll do a, do you really need a scale bar? That kind of thing. Um, then. And what I really want to do an idea I've got for a pie sliced hillshade map where I take eight different hillshade directions and I cut them into pie shapes. And so it's kind of like a center illuminated hillshade terrain. I want to see what that looks like. Don't anybody try that before I get to it. No, just kidding. You can do it. I don't know when I'll get to it. Um, and then dot density with a custom icon. I'm going to do it. How to make a dot density with a custom, like a little person SVG instead of a dot. Uh, so Parker Hinston wants to know if you have any enhancements or additions planned for your cabin. Um, no additions. Frankly, if I could redo it, I would make this thing smaller. It's 8 by 12, which made sense because it uh, had to be under 100 square feet if I didn't want to deal with building permits. <laughs> and I don't. Um, no, I love it. It's just great. I Speaking of additions, so this is a heater. In Michigan, we have to heat things in the wintertime or else we'll die. And um, this is a really nice addition, nice improvement. A little heater. Before I had like an electric heater, I burned my legs on and stuff before that. Nice. Um, let's see. Is there a way to override the random colors in ArcGIS Pro? That's from Andy Weber again. Oh, dang. Like, can you change which colors are randomly assigned to things when you drop in a new layer. I have no idea. I, I think there is some randomness involved. I don't know if you can change it to a predefined, like, hey, uh, Esri colleagues, if there are any still here, feel free to jump in on that one. That's a cool idea. I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. And I see lots of thank yous. Oh, wait, here's another question. When a project requires a chart, do you typically use ArcGIS Pro, Arc Pro's built-in charts? That's from Zach Wetzel. Pro's charts are getting better and better. I've I've used them before. Um, these days I haven't. It's just that I haven't done a lot of charting. I haven't integrated charts into my maps much lately. But I should. I think that's a good idea for a for a how-to coming up. Thanks for that idea. I'm gonna steal it. I'm gonna do it. 
Very nice. Um, mm -hmm. If there's any other questions, speak now. I want to thank you guys again for uh, inviting me. It's an honor to be able to speak with you all and um, show you random map stuff. But um, I certainly don't take it for granted. It's a pretty vibrant looking community. And um, maybe someday I'll see you in person. I'd be happy. That would make me happy. That, we hope that happens soon. And we want to thank you for agreeing to join us today. What a, what a fantastic talk. Um, and you have the right to drop in on any of the Esri sessions to uh, give those folks a hard time if you need to. Oh, perfect. Uh, will the charge be waived for me so I can get into them for free? Yes, because okay. this is all free. Thank you. <laughs> it might cost you a few jack bucks, though. I mean, yeah. Give me a charge code. Can we get, can we get some extra credits for, for <laughs> geocoding? Why? Credits are cheap. We refer to them as Jackbox. Jackbox. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the sessions are set to begin at, hang on a second. I've got it here. Yeah, we got a break coming up. Right. And then, the next, then the next one starts at 1045. There are three consecutive sessions. So pick the one you like or three have all three. You know, get three screens and, and um, have them all Come going on. on at the same time. Cool. <laughs> Three concurrent tracks, big deal. Big <laughs> and as Ned pointed out, they are being recorded and we'll um, make an announcement in a couple of days, probably next week and let everybody know where to find them uh, through our website. They'll be through YouTube. Um, Noni Castro had a question about the layouts. You did um, do your best to answer that. Anthony posted a, a link to a YouTube video, uh, an Esri video on on layouts. Uh, I, I shared that with her and I also shared it with everyone through the questions dialogue. So for those on the line here, um, there is a, in the uh, go to meeting um, dialogue box, there's, there's a section there for questions. Many of you found that because you were asking questions, um, but there should be a link there on the layouts and uh, thank Anthony for posting that. If there's any questions uh, that come up uh, after um, we we hang up with John, we'll we'll sure to pass them along. Yeah, and feel free to email me. My my email is John underscore Nelson at Esri com. John with an H underscore Nelson. And I would encourage those of you that don't, if you have Twitter, or even if you don't, it's worth getting an account just to follow John because he's he's <laughs> always posting and he's always providing links not only to his content but to other people's amazing content, and and it's it's well worth a follow. Thanks. That's literally too kind of you. <laughs> although although he did pull a fast one on me when we first announced that John was going to be our keynote and we put it on Twitter, he said, "Wait, what?" <laughs> I'm sorry. So I and, and I saw I, that. I do that I do that to people and uh I should have warned you in advance. <laughs> I like to troll troll uh well I love trolling Esri's um Twitter account. It's great. I always say don't follow this link, it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> oh you got you got me good. I saw that late at night and I was like, G -g 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 what? <laughs> sorry, buddy. That's all right. I'm going to do it again, though. All right. You got it. <laughs> um, I think we're uh, coming to a close here. Uh, thanks again, John. And everybody, uh, be sure to join those sessions. We have some great presentations coming.